You are listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love to talk about books. If you are looking for book recommendations, check out the two columns I write for a wonderful Houston publication, The Buzz Magazines. My weekly column is entitled Page Turners, and I highlight authors, books, and other fun book topics. For my monthly column, Buzz Reads, I choose my top five picks for each month. The articles can be found at www.thebuzzmagazines.com. You can also email me at cindyhburnett at att.net for personalized book recommendations. I get those requests all the time, and I really enjoy replying to them. Today, I am interviewing Brigitte Davis. Brigitte is the author of the memoir, The World According to Fanny Davis, My Mother's Life in the Detroit Numbers, a New York Times editor's choice and named a best book of 2019 by Kirkus Reviews, BuzzFeed, Real Simple, and Parade Magazine. She is also author of two novels, Into the Go Slow and Shifting Through Neutral, a graduate of Spelman College and Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. She lives in Brooklyn with her family. Visit her website at www.brigettedavis.com. I hope you enjoy the interview. Welcome, Brigitte Davis. I'm so glad you are joining me today. How are you? I'm great, Cindy. It's great to be here. So I am so excited to talk with you about The World According to Fanny Davis. It sounds like a completely fascinating story, and it's actually up next for me. I can't wait to read it. Will you tell me some about it? Yeah, so it is a memoir. It's about my mother, Fanny Davis, who had a a pretty unorthodox profession when I was growing up. My mother was a numbers runner, which means that she ran her own underground lottery business in Detroit, where we were living. And she did so for a decade, three decades to be exact. And more importantly, by doing so, she was able to give us a middle class life. And so this is the story of how she was able to pull that off and what exactly the numbers are and the milieu in which she found herself that made it necessary to make these choices. Well, that just sounds like an absolutely fascinating tale. And I was curious, how did you first discover that that's what she was doing? So it's fascinating um, to think about how some secrets play out in families. In our case, It wasn't a secret within the household. My mother was running essentially a home business. And so all of us knew what she was doing. In fact, my older siblings actually helped her run the business in various ways and guises. And even I, as a child, had one task (laughs) that I was in charge of doing. I was um, chosen to call her customers and tell them the winning numbers each evening. And so In some ways, it was a family business, but it was equally a family secret. So you knew you weren't supposed to say anything to anyone? Yes. I have said that we never talked about not talking about it, and yet I was born into that secret. So I knew without anyone saying, don't you ever tell anyone, I knew. Now, there were were five total children, is that correct? Correct. And where do you fall in that lineup? I'm the baby. <laughs> <laughs> so you got the job no one else wanted. Is that how it worked? Or maybe you got the job they felt that you could do? How did they, that come they about? Got the, I got the job that my mom knew I could handle. She knew I wanted to help in some way. And I was so proud of it. I, I took that really seriously. It felt like real responsibility. And my mother actually paid me to do it too. I would get $20 a week. And that felt like a fortune. (laughs) Well, I mean, it probably was a fortune, you know. I mean, I think for a kid, that's a lot. How many phone calls do you think per night you had to make? I only called her special customers. um, And those were the ones who uh, got that privilege of being called directly to be told the winning number. So it was about 10 or 12. I remember my mom had written down everyone's name and telephone number on this piece of notebook paper, and I would go through the list each evening. Yeah. How did you decide to write about this? I mean, obviously you lived it and it was something that you were familiar with, but what made you decide to actually write a memoir? It was a journey because I spent many years deciding not to write about it. I thought that there was no need to tell my mother's secret. Even 
after the lottery became legal in Michigan and then across the country, I didn't want to tell anyone what my mother had done. It was really not because I was ashamed of her. It was the opposite. I was really proud of her, but also super protective. I did not want anyone to judge her. My mom died many years ago in 1992, and still I insisted upon keeping that secret. So why did I finally write about it? It really did come down to two things. First, one day my son, who was 10 at the time, saw a photograph of my mother and he asked me, what was she like? He literally said that to me. So what was she like, mom? (laughs) And I answered, I said, oh, she was amazing. But of course my heart was breaking, of course, because It was literally in that moment that I came to understand that I had done this great job of keeping my mother's secret, but that meant that I had kept her secret from my own children. And that just was really upsetting and depressing. And and it made me realize that keeping the secret was not nearly as important as making sure everyone knew who my mother was and what she had accomplished. And so I changed my mind on that. I, I, The second thing that I realized in tandem with that was that, wow, you know, I could start forgetting. And and then what would that mean if I forgot what the numbers were like and what that experience growing up was like? Would I forget my mother or the things that made her who she was? So it became this double mission to reclaim a kind of reclamation project for myself and also the goal of creating a document of of her life so that my own children and, and, and many other people could have that document so it existed in the world. So suddenly this thing I kept secret became something I couldn't stop talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, They're like, yeah, write that book because you need to. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I've heard that story before. Um, yeah. Were your siblings good with that? I mean, obviously, I, I don't think it's a story. I mean, I understand it was a secret and you were wanting to keep it, but I mean, it's not something that I, I think once you got out there, you're probably remotely ashamed about. So were your siblings okay with you writing about it? Absolutely. You're right. It's a different experience if it's a dark secret. Right. Because that attaches all kinds of shame and complication to it. And you need to tell so you can let it go and you can move on and you can get out from under that shame. That wasn't what was happening here. Um, But I still made sure I got the one person's permission that I felt I needed. I went straight to my mom's sister, her remaining sister, who was having her 80th birthday. And I asked my aunt Florence, would she be okay if I told this story about her sister? And I said to her the whole story. And she said to me, yes, in fact, I'll help you tell it. Because you know what? What Fanny did was amazing and folks ought to know. Well, and I guess on some level it was a secret, but there must have been many people who knew because they were coming and giving money to her and participating. So it was probably one of those secret, not secret kind of things. It was an open secret. Exactly. Meaning That's that, a better word. <laughs> of course, the customers knew and we knew and, and our extended family and relatives knew. But on the other hand, it was also a well-kept secret beyond that. It's kind of stunning for me to think about it now, but my childhood friend, whom I've known since we were in fourth grade, did not know what my mother did for a living until I was interviewing her for this book. Wow. And she was in my house all the time. Really? Yeah. She was my friend. Yeah. And she said to me, what? (laughs) (laughs) And then she said the best thing. She said, you know, I always knew your mother was in charge of something. I just didn't know what. Well, and you know, that's funny because as a child, you just don't always pay attention to those things. I mean, you know, you're in and out of someone's home and you're playing and you're eating and you're doing other things and you don't really stop to think, I wonder what her mom is doing sitting there at the dining room table. You know, I mean, I think that's natural. Yeah, yeah. I was saying to people, and some people push back on this, but I'm like, how many of us really cared what our friend's parents did for a living or talked about what our own parents did for a living? 
And maybe some people did. Maybe it was a source of pride or it was so obvious what they did that it did come up in conversation. But my friends and I never talked about that. Maybe we would say, you know, my friend would say, yeah, my mom has to go to work tomorrow. And so I'm going to cook dinner, you know, things like that. But it just seemed to me that that was grown folks business. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I totally agree. I mean, unless someone's the mayor or the principal at the school or a teacher you're encountering at school, I mean, unless it's impacting a child's life, I, I completely agree with you. I'm not sure as a child, I knew what a lot of my friend's parents do. Now, of course I do now as an adult, but I mean, I, I would have not been able to say that about many of them when I was that right. age. Yeah. Yeah. So, Did it take you a long time to write the book? I'm sure whenever you ask an, a, a writer this, it's hard to get a straight answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because we're always trying to determine, when did I really begin that book? And, you know, it, it's like this movable target because we start, we stop. It's hard to, to gauge. But I can say this. I remember very vividly that trip to visit my Aunt Florence, which I consider the beginning of the process. Um, Because on that visit, I started to interview her and other family members. I literally recorded them. And that was 10 years ago. Wow. And then I spent two or three years doing just that, traveling to my mom's hometown and to other cities where relatives lived and where close family members were and friends. And I just recorded them. I ended up with 24 different. people whom I interviewed, some of whom I interviewed several times. So the first two or three years were spent like that, just gathering these collective voices. Because I always knew I wanted to do this memoir through my eyes of who my mom was, but I was very clear that I wanted it to be a communal memoir, that I wanted to capture a fuller picture of her through a lot of different lenses because a daughter sees her mother one way. Right. And I'm, I wanted that to be the driving force of the story, my point of view, but I really was hungry to bring in these other perspectives. And it helped me learn a lot too, a lot about my own mother. Well, I do think when you talk to other people, especially people that were adults when your mom was an adult, you're fleshing out other sides of her you probably never saw or again didn't think about. So no, I think it's nice. And what a treasure to have all those recordings saved for you to listen to anytime you want to pull them out. It's so beautiful. My mother had two remaining siblings, my aunt, as I spoke about, my aunt Florence and my uncle John. My uncle John was important because he loaned my mother the initial $100 so she could go into business. And he told me that story so beautifully about how she borrowed the money from him. And in 1958, $100 was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And he was able to, to loan it to her. And I have that story on tape. I love hearing his voice as he talks about it. I love hearing him say, Fanny tried to pay me back. I never let her. (laughs) and my uncle did he did die at the end of last year he was 93 was he able to see the book did he see it before he passed away or did he die before the book goodness yes and in fact i read that section to him the story of how he loaned her that money what do you hope your readers take away from this book i hope that readers will see this individual african-american woman and how she managed to make a way out of no way and really be inspired by her story and also understand that she is one person who represents all African-Americans who had enormous arbitrary obstacles placed in front of them that kept them from pursuing the most basic of American Um, goals, which was to simply pursue the American dream. And I have come to understand that more and more myself, that she really is an embodiment of the struggle and the triumph that pretty much describes Black life in this country. 
Well, and that is certainly a relevant topic today. Obviously, it's always been a relevant topic, but it is in the forefront at the moment with everything that's unfortunately happened, but then at least bringing the movement forward. And Mm so it's a great time to highlight a story like this when there's a lot of focus on trying to read more diversely. Um, This is the perfect tale for that. Yeah, yeah, I'm really feeling that way. Of course, none of us could predict the moment we're in right now. But even when I was writing the book, my motivation was it was more selfish. I thought, okay, I cannot determine what any reader will think about the choices my mom made. I can't decide that they will be um, understanding of her deciding to take on this informal underground business. But I will make sure that readers understand the context that she found herself in. And so readers will at least know why she made that choice, whether or not they agree with it, they'll know why she made it. And that was my impulse to put all of this context in. But then I realized, and I have really come to understand it in the last couple of weeks, what I was really doing was tracking American institutional racism by simply talking about my mother's migration north, which wasn't just oh, I think we want to have a better life. They were really escaping a kind of terrorism. They wanted civil liberties. That's why they left Tennessee to come to Michigan. When my mother couldn't find work and my father faced all this discrimination in the auto industry, they were scrambling to stay out of or dig themselves out of a newfound poverty that had nothing to do with poor choices. It had everything to do with this Northern racism they weren't prepared for. That's what led her into this particular business because she had no other choices and she did not want to just settle for an impoverished life. That was really what that was about. And one more example I'll just add, I talked about how she had to buy her home, our family home in Detroit, even though she had the money and the means she could not get a mortgage because 90% of African Americans were completely just blocked out of the housing market vis a vis redlining. Mm-hmm. People talk about that now, but to have had a mother who faced it and had to make pretty precarious alternative choices and enter into a very risky contract with the seller of the house because she had no other means to get her home really speaks to this unbelievable disadvantage that African Americans are facing that's separate and apart from whether they have the means. You no, know, it's not just that. It's just every unbelievable obstacle that can be put in front of you when you are trying to just be an American citizen, you know, and take advantage of what the country claims that it offers. Yeah, and just live your life. And and it's impossible to live your life when all of those barriers are continually thrown in front of you. I knew, um, I went to college in Chicago and did a variety of research projects there, a lot on the red line in Chicago. And, you know, Chicago has a terrible history with that. Virulent. Yeah, I mean, just horrible. And I had no idea until I started looking into all of that. But, um, But obviously it's prevalent other places too. And it's just, it's crazy. And it made me think of when I was reading that summary of your book, actually, and it made me think of that recent movie, The Bankers, where the two guys couldn't buy a bank because they were black and they had to put a white guy. It was like in the fifties or sixties. And I thought this is it's just insane. I you just can't, can't quite <laughs> understand. I, I just can't e- even understand. But I think that as people read your mother's stories, no one should be judging. I mean, that's fabulous that she figured out some way to support her family with something that was going to be happening somewhere else anyway, and to to try to raise her children in a you know the way she felt she should be entitled and she was entitled to do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, funny about the things that frightened us when we are sort of concerned about our loved ones and our protectiveness um, towards them. After all those years of being so concerned about what people would think, the book comes out and of, and, and of course the opposite thing happens. My inbox fills <laughs> with people's testimonies and wanting to say to me how much they admire my mother. And so that is really, I guess, what can I say? I'm sure she's smiling from on high, you know? <laughs> I'm she sure always, she is. 
I must say she always was clear about what she was doing. She never felt that it was anything but a legitimate business that just happened to be illegal. Yeah. Means to an end. I mean, definitely. And yeah, I, I, I think that's fabulous. I really like the cover for your book. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. a definite cover person. I always enjoy looking at covers and seeing in the end if they tie in with the story. I really like your cover. How did that come about? Oh, wow. <laughs> it started as a more collage-like cover that had these beautiful colors happening in it. But also, I loved some things about it, that it was joyful, but it felt a little too busy and non-serious. And so that began this journey of how to keep that collage-like feel, but give it a little more gravitas. And that sent the designers on the journey uh, towards what ultimately became the cover. And I will say there was this beautiful moment when the publisher of Little Brown, who was then uh, Reagan Arthur, she's moved on since then, but she stepped in and really made the suggestion that they put the little yellow shoes on the cover. And I was always grateful to her for that, that she really made sure that I loved the cover and that she would have a say so in what would make it work. And when I said that to her, thank you so much. She just looked at me and she said, it's your mother. (laughs) (laughs) know That doesn't always happen. I mean, sometimes, you know, you hear these stories of people opening up their email and, you know, bursting into tears because they're like, this cover is terrible. Um, You know, so it's nice that she was happy to listen to you and help suggest ideas that, that would make you feel good about the cover. I really respected her for that. And I I was so appreciative. And it is true. You want to go out in the world with something that you feel good about every time you look at it, right? Mm -hmm, (laughs) For sure. It's so personal. I'm looking at it right now. (laughs) And so it's like, if I had to a hundred times go, oh. (laughs) <laughs> what would that be like? You know? Exactly. It'd be terrible. Uh, so no, I, I agree completely. So that that is great that she was willing to work with you on that and, and come up with something because it is your mother too. So it's a very personal story, something I'm that glad. you're very comfortable with. Yeah. And I'm happy to hear you like it. Like I haven't really talked to that many people. People would sort of really reach out on social media and say, I love the cover, but I haven't really talked about the cover with people and it's nice when I'm reminded that folks do like it because I I know I love it because I love looking at my mom's picture. (laughs) Well, I think um, there's so many books out there today and so many different ways to pull them up. And so you need something that's going to catch your eye and draw you in and make you think, well, I wonder what this book is about. Pick it up and start looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an art. I will say that. And I know a lot of authors complain about covers. I've been that author too in the past, but it's really a complicated kind of, you know, stew of concerns. I, I, I wouldn't want the job of figuring out a book's cover. (laughs) No, I agree. And then there's always cover trends, you know, things that seem to be happening at the same time every once in a while, you know, a large buyer like Barnes and Noble will step in and say, I don't, we're not selling this book with this cover. So, I mean, there's a lot of different things that go on. So you're right. It is not a job that would be very easy. No, that happened with my first novel, both Barnes and Noble and remember Borders? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. They both stepped in and said they wouldn't buy as many copies if that cover remained. I just find that fascinating. I, I learned that when a friend of mine had that happen to her last year. I had no idea that was even a thing till she was saying, well, I had a cover I really liked. And then Barnes & Noble nixed it. And I had no idea that that could even happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's marketing, right? Exactly. No really knows. It's such an inexact science that everyone's just trying to like hedge their bets. So, yeah. And that's true. And who knows if Barnes & Noble will continue to have that kind of weight. Yeah. Yeah. Are you working on anything at the present that you'd like to share with me? I am actually. I'm quite excited because the news uh, just became official yesterday. I am developing the screenplay for the movie version of the book. Oh, that's so exciting. Yes. I'm very excited to be writing the screenplay. Let me just tell you. I bet. (laughs) 
<laughs> Again, yeah. another thing that could go horribly wrong. So that's wonderful <laughs> that you're staying involved and that that's going to work. So tell me more about that. Yeah. So it's going to be produced by Plan B, which if you don't know, that's Brad Pitt's uh, production company. And they have a beautiful track record of telling African-American stories. And that was really important to me. They did Moonlight, If Beale Street Could Talk, Selma, 12 Years a Slave. They have a great track record. Most and definitely. So they're a great producing team. And it will be uh, actually put out by Searchlight Pictures. Okay. So all of that is really wonderful. You know, my job now is to produce the screenplay. <laughs> Do you have a deadline for that? I, I don't really know how that works on that side of things. Do they, you, you're now ready to go to write the screenplay. Do they give you a time frame? In a way, yes. There is a contractual time frame where you have so many weeks to produce each draft. But, you know, these things are fluid. Mm -hmm. And the whole goal is to produce something everyone's happy with. So I would say yes and no. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yes, I should be working on this. And no, it's not due on a particular day. Well, that is very exciting news. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm so glad you've joined me. And I'm going to wrap up now with my last question, which is to tell me about some of your recent favorite recommended reads. Oh, yeah. I was someone during the early part of, of quarantine who was reading a lot of books and then not so much. I don't know how different people have um, handled these weeks sheltering in place. But what, I, what really resonated with me was this beautiful memoir, Sarah Broom, The Yellow House. It's done quite well and deservedly so. It's just one of the most gorgeously written books I have ever read. Um, and it's uh, at the top of my list. I also have been reading this collection of essays that I find quite timely by Emily Bernard called Black is the Body. And one more, I love biographies, especially biographies of fascinating women. So Imani Perry wrote Looking for Lorraine, which came out, I think, a year or two ago. But I just read it, and it's the most unusual memoir, uh, I should say the most unusual biography, she calls it like a third person memoir. I and haven't so, seen that one before. That sounds interesting. Yeah, it's really fascinating. We all know about Lorraine Hansberry from A Raisin in the Sun, but we don't really know her. And she, her life, her radical life, the choices she made, her friendship with James Baldwin, all of it feels so resonant and timely. I got so much inspiration from reading about her life. Yeah, so that was another one. Home Baked. This is, I call this woman, Aaliyah Bolts, my like spiritual sister, because <laughs> Home Baked is about how her mother made marijuana brownies in San Francisco in the 70s. <laughs> And had a whole business. <laughs> so you guys could bond about your, your mother's businesses. We totally bonded <laughs> around that whole topic. Yes. So I wanted to really shout out that book too. It's really well done. It's beautiful. Well, those all sound fabulous and I need to go check each and every one of them out. I'm familiar with the first one, The, the Yellow House, but I'll have to look at all of the rest of them. Yeah. Yeah. I really recommend it. Well, Bridget, I can't thank you enough for joining me today. This has been a very entertaining and interesting interview, and I'm so glad you joined me. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts From A Page. Leave a review wherever you listen to your podcast. This particularly helps me out a lot. And tell all of your friends about the podcast. I would really appreciate it. Bridgette's book can be purchased at Murder by the Book, where I work part-time, and the link is in the show notes. Thanks to Susie Leopold of Susie Approved Book Tours and Reviews for connecting Bridgette with me, and thanks to KP Regan for the sound editing. And as always, thank you for listening. Hi there, I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. 
It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. So while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardnopodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no.